Thank you. Let me begin my remarks tonight by quoting that great philosopher, Yogi Berra, who once opened a celebratory dinner by saying, I'm happy to have played for this great team for so many years. I want to thank everyone who made this event necessary. <laughs> it's an honor to have been roasted tonight by the most fiscally conservative governor of my 50 years in public life, Tom Salmon. <laughs> Also, my good friend Jim Douglas, who upon leaving the governor's office, still popular after eight successful years, might prophetically have said, as Louis XV did, après moi la deluge. <laughs> as the chief researcher of a think tank, I keep files on people and events. In preparation for my few minutes here tonight, I brought along these two loose leaf volumes. One is labeled, Some Mistakes of Thomas P. Salmon. And this one is labeled, Some Mistakes of James H. Douglas. <laughs> Incidentally, I'm still adding to the volume labeled, Some Mistakes of Peter Shumlin. <laughs> and though he's only been governor for three years, the notebook is already three or four times as thick as the total of the two volumes I brought with me tonight. The, the section on buying property in East Montpelier is already three inches thick. But on reflection, I decided it would be unkind of me to recite the errors these two fine gentlemen may or may not have made while in office. So let me just mention what I thought were their finest moments as governors. Seriously. For Tom Salmon, it was when he explained to Vermont Democrats that federal price controls on interstate natural gas were killing New England. Southwestern producers wouldn't sell gas into pipelines because they couldn't make enough money. So they sold locally and waited for a regulatory price increase later on. The Texas and Oklahoma economies were booming from their own natural gas, and New England couldn't get enough at a controlled price. Our businesses depended on cheap natural gas were being outcompeted by businesses that were located in or had migrated to where it was available. Vermont Democrats are traditionally allergic to the word deregulate, and Tom didn't gain much political credit for explaining to his own partisans what any economist would have seen right away. I've always given Tom credit for having the political courage to speak the truth on this issue, whether his supporters wanted to hear it or not. For Jim Douglas, his finest moment was, in my view, his 13-page veto message of the goofy health care reform scheme offered up by Democratic legislators in June 2005. In his words, this bill will create a new government-run, taxpayer-financed health care program that would lead Vermont toward a system of fewer choices, fewer benefits, and fewer health care providers. The bill would also impose new payroll taxes on small businesses and nonprofit organizations, and a regressive income tax surcharge on the working poor to finance the limited health care coverage it proposes. Such a financing mechanism punishes low and moderate income workers who are at least able to afford these regressive taxes. We need to tackle the root causes of rising health care costs, open up our system to low-cost options, encourage healthy decisions in preventive care, and attack health concerns at their inception. And we need to maintain a patient-centered system that offers more individual choice and keeps health care decisions in the hands of patients and doctors, not government bureaucrats. This veto message was so devastating that the single-payer leadership of the legislature didn't even try to override it. Vermont had to wait six years for the arrival of the present governor to drag the shredded remains of House 2524 out of the Douglas trash can and enacted as Act 48. So without necessarily acquiescing in any of the inaccurate and misguided remarks Tom and Jim might have made this evening, I'm honored to be able to recollect some fine moments from the public careers of each man. But that's all in the past. <laughs> I want you all to know that on this 20th anniversary of the Ethan Allen Institute, I'm excited about our future. It's not because people who subscribe to our principles control the workings of state government. That's far from the truth. It's because as the current unaffordable, liberty-crushing big government schemes 
come unglued over the next few years, as they surely will, the people of this state will start seriously looking for a remedy. Our institute is a, new, a fine new president, Rob Roper, whose intelligence, energy, and activity are advancing our cause every day. We have a good board of respected Vermont leaders, including our newest member, former Secretary of Commerce and Community Development, Milt Eaton, who's with us tonight. And we have the ideas for Vermont's future, derived from our Constitution and from the principles set forth in our mission statement that can form the basis of solvency, prosperity, and progress. Our task today is to continue to work together, to build our support, to broaden our reach, to market sound, workable alternatives to emerging disasters, and to continue to effectively preach the gospel of liberty, property, fiscal responsibility, enterprise, and opportunity. We've done that for 20 years, thanks to the sustained support of many of the people in this room and many others who couldn't attend this evening. Now we need to step up the pace for the next 10 or 20 years. I want to thank all of you, especially Rob, the board, our co-founder John Mitchell, our event manager Darcy Johnston, Governor Salmon and Governor Douglas, and especially my wife Ann, who is not only a co-founder of the Institute, but also a faithful and dependable co-worker for me for all these years. Now you've heard enough from me, let's get on with the entertainment. 